we'd been, um, we'd started the, you know, our journey in, in sort of Morocco and we were flying across the Western Sahara about four days over the desert. And we thought not much to see. The balloon was working really well at that point early on in the flight. But what was the most amazing thing to me was the beauty of the landscape of the Sahara. It was just amazing. And at dawn and dusk, the changing colors in the desert are just almost too difficult to describe, except to say that they were so beautiful it could bring tears to the eye. We'd put a mattress out from the bunk on the floor and we'd lie with our head in the hatch at the back of the, the capsule and just watch in awe of, of the sun coming up and the colors changing in the desert. Bertrand said to me, uh, what do you think it is, Brian, that makes some people so incredibly lucky? I mean, here we are, we're sitting in this balloon, realizing a dream of flying around the world. And yet, if we look out and we see in this beautiful landscape, if we could take a telescope and look a little more closely, we'd see children dying in the thousands of diseases we hadn't seen in Europe for I don't know, generations. Um, and it was that kind of almost ridiculous difference on, on the balance of scales of what we were seeing and what was actually happening down there, that um, we thought that if we succeeded, well, whether we succeeded or not, we, would, we had a duty to do something to pay back some of our luck. So then when you landed, you made aviation history, you broke seven world records, you were awarded the Hubbard Medal from the National Geographic Society and an OBE. Tell me how that felt. Well, it felt pretty good. <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it was extraordinary, actually. Um, I know from um, when we landed in Egypt, uh, and we were rescued by the Egyptians. We were flown by a military helicopter to the, the nearest town before we were picked up by a Breitling jet, which took us to Cairo. And um, the local dignitary there, the, the mayor, uh, decided that we, would, we should see his brand new water filtration plant. So there were lots of blue flashing lights and um, we were driven at speed um, and were wearing these um, thick fire flame-proof overalls, our flight suits, um, big boots that we'd taken off in. And it was quite warm, I have to say, and we were unbelievably tired. We'd, after we landed, we'd been in the desert for seven hours before we were rescued. And, and um, that was a bit of a story in itself. But um, so we were incredibly tired and then uh, we had to smile and you know act graciously while we were shown around a water filtration plant. <laughs> Uh, but eventually we, we got back the Cairo press conference, which was our first press conference um, with, with so many cameras. It was quite, it was quite incredible. Um, and I remember the first question was that, uh, was actually from BBC. Um, what do you say to those people who um, consider it that the money could have been better spent on uh, uh, more philanthropic ways? And believe it, you know. What was your answer? Well, my answer was, well, I think that that question uh, yeah, shows that you that there's possibly a lack of um, historical, uh, you know, awareness. And Bertrand came to our rescue actually and said, "Look, that money would never have been spent on philanthropy. It was always a marketing budget, and would always be a marketing budget, even if it wasn't the balloon." Um, so that was that was one thing. Then we were flown back to Switzerland, uh, which was great. We were in this private jet. We landed in Switzerland on a Monday morning, and uh, as we were taxiing around, we couldn't see anybody, and it was. We just thought, I think Bertrand said, "Oh well, we should have come back over the weekend, you know, when when we had lots of people." And I said to him, I think joking, I said, "Well, at least they could have put us you know, cleaner out there with a." flag or something to, to wave at us. Anyway, we, we taxied around into the private um, uh, jet area and there were thousands of people. I just 
it's unbelievable the reception that we had. Uh, something I'll never forget. And um, I remember it's just the applause went on and on. And, and uh, I stood up and that, on this sort of dais. And I think the first thing I said was, what an extraordinary country where nobody goes to work on a Monday. <laughs> um, but that was the beginning of it, really. And uh, I flew back to the UK on a Thursday. On the Saturday morning, I was in seat 1A on Concord with my wife, Joanna, going out to New York because uh, they wanted us for the... Um, centenary of the Explorers Club dinner. Um, we got there and I was um, sat next to John Glenn on the top table and I just thought, well, I just, I mean, what's life going to be like from here on? And I just had no idea. It's just, it's incredible. And that kind of went on for a while. Um, celebrity is relatively short-lived and uh, I was sort of 52 years old when we did the round the world flight. So I don't think I was affected, you know, by the, the glamour, if you like, and then the fame, uh, although it was fabulous to fly first class and, uh, and limousines and all the rest of it. But we met some extraordinary people. Uh, we met most of the astronauts. Um, we met Buzz Aldrin, uh, we were all three of the guys in Apollo 11, um, Neil, Buzz and Mike and um, President Clinton, uh, you know, the Queen, I mean, you name it, we, we were just, it was just a whirlwind of interviews, TV appearances, um, and then it starts to dwindle and it all sort of fades away. And, and I was, I think, mature enough to think, well, that was great while it lasted and okay, now it's gone back to... Uh, to being Mr. Normal again. Um, perhaps never quite be Mr. Normal again, but as close as possible. And is there anything that, so the Brian post balloon journey would go back in time and tell Brian pre balloon journey. And is there anything you learned about yourself on that trip? I don't, um, I mean, I learned certainly that uh, how I dealt with situations, life-threatening situations. That, that was a, a big learning experience, I think. I mean, there were probably three times when we came quite close to dying on that flight. And uh, um, so you learned that, that whatever happened in life, that you could cope with that kind of uh, stress, if you like. Um, <clears throat> I didn't think that I'd changed. I mean, you probably have to ask my wife, but uh, I don't think I changed as a person, except that I, I must have changed emotionally because there was an experience. I was on um, TV. I was doing a, a TV interview show. And um, before I went on, I was in, in the studios. I was in the green room. And it was just after the, the, the flight. And it was at the time of all the, um, the Baltic issues in um, um, Kos uh, sorry, Kosovo, and um, the terrible war that was going on out there. And I was, I was look watching the news in, in the green room, and um, there were all just thousands upon thousands of refugees coming out of Kosovo and uh, reports of mass killings and all that kind of stuff. Um, and normally I was never an emotional sort of person watching that, but actually there were tears rolling down my cheeks. And I thought, you know, that, that's not me, but it is me now. And I don't know what changed, but something inside emotionally did change. And I think that helped when we set up our foundation after that, our charities in, in Africa. That kind of helped on that um, emotional level and the empathy that, uh, that one should have for situations like that in the world. So you mentioned charity work. So you're very involved with Aerability as one of our ambassadors at Aerability. Talk to me about charity work and why you think it's important um, and what you think it brings to you. I think, uh, the, well, the importance of it, it actually started uh, when we were flying across Sahara. We'd been, um, we'd started the, uh, our journey in, in sort of Morocco and we were flying across 
uh, sorry, Western Sahara, and we were flying across. About four days over the desert, we thought not much to see. The balloon was working really well at that point early on in the flight. Um, but what was the most amazing thing to me was the beauty of the landscape of the Sahara. It was just amazing. And at dawn and dusk, the changing colors in the desert are just almost too difficult to describe, except to say that they were so beautiful it could bring tears to the eye. I mean, just, it was incredible. And, and whoever wasn't flying the balloon, both of us actually, we were, we'd put a mattress out from the bunk on the floor and we'd lie with our head in the hatch at the back of the, the capsule and just watch in awe of, of the sun coming up and the colors changing the desert. Bertrand said to me, uh, I think we were having breakfast actually one morning, he said, what do you think it is, Brian, that makes some people so incredibly lucky? I mean, here we are, we're sitting in this balloon, realizing a dream of flying around the world, spent maybe a million pounds plus in putting us here. We've got a dozen or so people on the ground trying to keep us here. And yet, if we look out and we see in this beautiful landscape, if we could take a telescope and look a little more closely, we'd see children dying in the thousands of diseases we hadn't seen in Europe for generations. Um, and it was that kind of almost ridiculous difference on, on the balance of scales of what we were seeing and what was actually happening down there that um, we thought that if we succeeded, well, whether we succeeded or not, we, would, we had a duty to do something to pay back some of our luck. Um, and as luck would have it, we did succeed and uh, won a million dollars from Budweiser for, for that. And then that, that money went towards setting up our foundation called the Winds of Hope, which is now working in Africa to try to help uh, children suffering in unreported circumstances. Um, and we, we visited several countries in Africa and that was when it really came home that charity is important. Um, it is important to give something back, particularly if you've been as lucky uh, as we were and enjoyed a, a blessed life, really. Um, and I think I became much more aware of, of charity after that and, uh, and then became aware of Arability and the wonderful work it does and, and how I could become involved. So with Arability, you've done some instructing in the balloon to help our disabled community learn to fly. Tell me a little bit more about that and then perhaps tell me about what you think makes a good instructor. Well, I met Mike Miller-Smith, uh, the CEO of Arability, um, and we were chatting uh, about general flying um, and I was quite keen to uh, introduce ballooning for disabled people. I'd met um, a guy when I was in the States uh, who was the first uh, balloonist that I was aware of that was in a wheelchair. And um, Michael Glenn, his name was. And uh, he was sort of inspirational. He had a commercial license and he was flying passengers in the States. And I thought this was just fabulous. And so I was talking to Mike and I said, there, is no, there are no disabled uh, pilots of balloons in here, as far as I'm aware, in Europe. Um, and so perhaps we could, perhaps I could help in that sense, um, set something up, which is what we did. And uh, so I was very fortunate with Breitling, who were still our sponsor and who were um, obviously grateful that we got around the world, but were very kind and generous to us. And they agreed to pay for a, a, a balloon which had a double chair. Uh, and that was what we used to, uh, to start training uh, disabled people to become pilots. Um, we trained seven, five of whom now have their uh, pilot's licenses. Um, and uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a fantastic uh, journey uh, to see a disabled person who can sit next to me in a double chair in a balloon and as soon as we're off the ground 
there is no difference between myself as an able-bodied person and that person who can't feel their legs because they're just using their hands and their eyes to, to, to fly the balloon. And I think it's, they feel a great sense of freedom uh, and it's, it's inspiring. And what do you think of the mental health benefits in those scenarios? Well, I, I mean, how can you, how can you measure it? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, you only have to look at some of the uh, aerobility meets where people go flying and the smile on their face tells it all. You know, you, you, there's no need to measure it. You can see it. It's very obvious. This sort of sense of freedom and joy and um, uh, elation. And in terms of instructing, so going back quite a bit before you were an instructor and you were chief examiner in the UK for ballooning, what do you think makes a good instructor? And what advice would you give to someone under, say, test conditions or exam conditions um, in terms of managing that stress and that anxiety? I think probably the most important thing for an instructor is to very often shut up and listen and look. Um, and now, of course, you have to instruct and, and there's a lot of talking involved. But you can overwhelm your, um, your students sometimes. And you need to be aware of what you're saying and how you're instructing that it makes a lot of sense to you, but are you making the same sense to your student? You know, do they understand? And, and it's important to kind of look into their eyes when you're talking to them and, and gauge whether they got it or they haven't got it and whether you need to back off a little bit or push them a little bit further. Um, and I think that's the art of instructing is, is that relationship you have with your student um, and not being a know-all and, you know, I, I know and you don't kind of thing. Uh, you have to to bring them along this, this journey. In terms of examining, it's a whole different ball game in, in the sense that everybody's nervous. I mean, even I'm nervous, even now, you know, if, um, if I have to have a flight check. But um, you, and of course, examiners understand that the students are going to be nervous, and possibly shaking, nervous to the point that they kind of forget things uh, very easily. And so, as an examiner, it's important to put a, put a candidate at their ease, if you can, early on, um, explain to them what's going to happen uh, during the flight test, be nice uh, and say, I understand you're nervous. All I'm looking for is a safe flight and a legal flight. You can make mistakes, that's fine, and we'll correct them, but keep me safe, keep, keep it legal, and you'll be absolutely fine. Um, and if they can take off in a slightly more relaxed mode uh, than just, and I've, I've seen so many examiners and, and had one myself where they say nothing except, okay, go, uh, go here, uh, climb 5,000 feet, do this, do that. And you think, oh my God, you know, and you're kind of wondering whether you've done it right all along. Whereas I think a good examiner will actually talk to their candidate. So Brian, this is an incredible story that you've shared with us today. But tell me, what are your proudest moments or achievements today, both professionally and personally? I think there was the one that I mentioned, actually, that moment when I felt I could make that balloon dance. You know, it's a, almost a million cubic feet. It's 186 feet tall and it's got I don't know, 10 tons of inertia. Um, and uh, this sort of little person is flying it and in, in total, in fully, full, in full control. Um, that was that moment, I think, when that realization came was I felt really good about myself. And um, because I think, I mean, even as a pilot and even with my track record in ballooning, I think everybody doubts themselves. And, um, you know, as I said, in a, in a, before a flight test, I'm nervous and all the rest of it because you're not, I don't know, I think you just doubt yourself. It's just part of human nature. Um, but that moment was, was very special. In terms of proud, I think I was quite proud of 
this little badge that I'm wearing, uh, which was one of the awards that Bertrand and I were given after the flight, was the uh, Olympic Order. And um, it's normally given to athletes who've won a minimum of five gold medals in the Olympic Games. It was given to Bertrand and I, uh, and the citation read were to the effect that it wasn't so much for what you did, but how you did it, and uh, that you performed completely within the Olympic spirit, with you know, with the duration of your flight, the way you treated your competitors, and the way you spoke about it, and and that was a, a lovely citation actually. And I thought, yeah, that's I was. That's, I'm very proud of my Olympic order, as well as all the others. Uh, so you mentioned about self-doubt, which is very interesting because I think that resonates with a lot of our viewers and listeners. So just give me some tips for managing self-doubt. Okay. Um, the Parachute Regiment has a motto, which is knowledge dispels fear. And I really relate to that in terms of ballooning and flying and everything else. The more knowledgeable you are about what you're doing, the more confidence you have and the less doubt that you have. So learn as much as you can, never stop learning, and you will become more confident in what you're doing. So Brian, tell me what's next then? What does the future hold for Brian? <laughs> well, I'm not sure, I'm 76 years old. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I think it's, um, it's time to, uh, lean back on the laurels, I think. Um, unfortunately, uh, medical-wise, I, I can no longer fly. Um, and that's sort of been two years ago, I had to give up ballooning, give up my license at least. Um, so I don't fly anymore, except on a simulator. Um, I just think that uh, I've retired virtually completely and um, you know I, I play golf and uh, play around on computers and, and try to keep myself busy while well, I do keep myself uh, very busy and then try to help wherever I can in terms of um, charitable work and philanthropic stuff um, and I think that's a, a way of fading into the sunset which is uh, agreeable. For anybody who wants to start ballooning them, because you've spoken about it with such passion and enthusiasm, what would you say to them is the best place to start? Yeah, well, there's, um, there's a, a club called the British Balloon and Airship Club and uh, BBAC, and they have a website, which is bbac.org. Um, and that will tell you all of the information that one might need to know about how one gets started in ballooning. Um, and as I said, it's a, a gentle, beautiful sport. And uh, anybody who feels that way inclined should really go for it. And what do you think others can learn from your remarkable and inspirational story? I'm not sure. I think it depends on the individual. Um, I mean, I've given a, a lot of talks and I don't try to teach anything or lecture anything in my talks. I just tell it as it is, the story, and allow people to take from it um, what they will. And I think different people will take different things from it as to how it applies to them. So, um, yeah. Is there any one parting piece of advice that you'd like to share with us today? I think that in life, we have many opportunities come along and Opportunities pass us by. Sometimes we don't even know it. But what I would say to anybody, and particularly to the younger uh, element, is that if you do recognize the, any opportunities that are floating by, reach out both hands, grab them, and take advantage. Because your life will be uh, enhanced for sure. Brian, this has been an incredible story of resilience, overcoming adversity, of persistence. So thank you so much for sharing it with us today. I'm sure it will resonate with many of our viewers and listeners. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Harriet. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank you.